Welcome to lecture 6c, Domain Specific Accelerators. We already seen how a tiled chip multi-core processors are working. And then we know that this is generally used in those applications where heavy and computations are required and all your cores that are arranged inside your chip in various styles can work parallelly. So that task which require heavy and computation can be done with a significant higher throughput. Today we will learn about a new class of architectures known as domain specific accelerators where how the existing hardware that you have can be used for specific applications like the neural network applications as a case study and we will see how the memory, the interconnect and the processor side are working together in order to give good performance for specific neural network applications. Before going into the topic, let us try to understand what are the limitations of a general purpose CPU. If you talk about a general purpose CPU, it has its own processor and it has its own kind of a memory that is available and the typical way in which you work is you fetch the instruction decode and then you execute using the processor engine that you have. But for execution of these instructions, we know that it involves a fetching cost, a decoding cost and then you are going to execute. So it is not only merely execution that we are talking here, we are always talking about the other peripheral operations, the other associated operations that need to be done in order to carry out the execution. So let me try to introduce a term known as Turing tariff. It refers to the cost of performing functions using a general purpose hardware. So in a conventional CPU, we have this. We already know that what do you mean by Turing machine? It is a theoretical machine known as Turing machine, which is proposed by Alan Turing and that could perform any function. Whatever function that you wanted to do, you can still realize it using the help of a Turing machine. But whatever Turing machine that we have, it need not be necessarily performing the task in the most efficient way. So let us try to see what is that uh, the trouble that you have. If you talk about a conventional CPU architecture and then you are going to have some kind of instruction execution, the energy dissipated for the fetch decode execution is much more than that of the pure execution portion. So only the execution in the functional unit will take a very small amount of energy dissipation whereas the energy associated with fetching and decoding is roughly 10x to 4000x times more than what you have in the execution component alone. This means that fetching and decoding involve significant of amount of an overhead. So when you come to huge programs where huge computation is involved, even if it is computation intensive, lot many computation I have to do, but if you look about the fetching and decoding of the instructions and the corresponding data in order to carry out an execution is highly demanding both in terms of overhead in terms of area as well as the energy. So how to mitigate this gap that you have? One is you can go for a hardware centric approach. Second one you can go for a software centric approach or you can go for a combination of all these. Now let me introduce you to the concept of ASIC. ASIC stands for application specific integrated circuit. It is often used for a single function and we are not going to uh, change this code much frequently. Rarely the code changes. So we have an IC or we have a chip which is going to perform a task. So there is, it is specially dedicated for a particular application wherein the code is embedded into it. So it's an application specific. There is nothing like we are going to reprogram it for a different task. So your general purpose CPU is in one end, the ASIC is in the other end. In general purpose CPU, you can load the memory with different programs. And when you execute this program, the same CPU is capable of performing different tasks. It all depends upon what is the program that you are going to fetch and execute. Whereas in the case of an ASIC, there is nothing like fetching and execution. It's pre-programmed for something and then that's only what it is going to do. So reprogramming is not there. Now something in between this, that is, it is I'm not going to one extreme where it is completely customized like an ASIC and the other extreme that is completely non-customized, it's having higher flexibility like your GPU. Something in between is known as domain specific accelerators or it's also known as domain specific architectures. 
it is specific for a class of application your graphics processing unit which we already learned in the first half of the course GPU is a domain specific architecture your neural network processors NNP is another class of domain specific architecture and then processors for software defined networks the SDN they are also part of domain specific architectures that we are going to learn. Consider the case of an add operation that you need to do first you have to fetch from the iCache then you have access the registers in order to add and then appropriate control signals are generated and then you perform the actual adding operation inside the ALU. If you look at the power that is being consumed it is 25 picojoules, 6 picojoules for register access whereas 70 picojoules is something that you do for overall that you do in the entire case wherein less than 1 picojoule may be only used for the adding. So, this is what happens in the case of a CPU overall out of 70 picojoules less than 1 or 2 picojoules is the real add operation. The others are all the associated operation wherein the operands are moved into the ALU which will carry out the task. Now, coming to ASIC the overheads are very very less because of the design. So, most of the fraction of the effort that you put in is really gone for the execution. So, this is the broader difference this is the basically the Turing tariff that we are going to talk about. So, CPU incur lot of overhead actual execution will be having a very small component, but it is highly reprogrammable. So, a hardware computing engine that is specialized for a particular domain of application is known as domain specific accelerators. So, it is basically meant for specialized operation which has plenty of parallelism in it and we use efficient memory system and overall it will reduce the overhead together we call it as DSA or domain specific accelerators and in some cases we will call it as domain specific architectures. So, there are a lot of uh, application domains in which uh, this kind of DSAs are used. It is used for highly specific graphics application with lot of graphic movement is there especially in gaming environment where if it would be good if you have a domain specific accelerators or an architecture that supports the gaming application. In deep learning kind of application where lot of uh, convolution neural networks are being used in some kind of simulations with a lot of graphics operation that is been coming heavy in computation that is coming in certain kind of simulations. In bioinformatics field we have this processing of images and videos we have security surveillance we have. So, we have lot of applications lot of class of applications where DSA can make a big difference in the throughput and in the performance. Now, let us come and talk about the kind of uh, landscape of computing we have already told that one end is your CPU which has a processor the memory and then you can reprogram it lot of flexibility that is offering the other end is the ASIC the application specific integrated circuit. So, what you see in the figure is that you have the CPU that is there and the other end is the ASIC. Uh, so, these three when it comes to FPGA and GPUs we also call it as accelerators or core processors. So, when you move from ASIC to CPU there is lot of flexibility I can reprogram I can load more different programs into it and get it done. But if you look at the efficiency in processing ASIC would be more efficient because of the less overhead that you have and the cost per unit also is going to be more when you move it to ASIC. Let us try to understand the difference between an ASIC and FPGA and the GPU and then CPU from this landscape that we are going to talk about. When you wanted to your acceleration to be done with the help of an ASIC. So, what you do is this is having the highest efficiency cost per unit is very high, but high non recurring engineering I cannot re engineering I cannot uh, you know, reprogram it once you put up something into the ASIC that is final and that is only capable of producing the output based upon the input that you have given. So, there is absolutely no programmability that you have it is a hardware logic for a single application domain it lacks flexibility that is one important component not at all flexible, but if you know let us say it can be an ASIC adder given input A and B and then you produce C. So, this is used only for an adding operation let us say it can be an ASIC for a square root and an ASIC for a security or a password generation. So, it can do only that class of an operation. The next category of acceleration is about FPGAs, FPGAs are field programmable gate arrays. These are all kind of an IC which consists of programmable logic blocks and then I can program it I can put up a bit stream into it which is basically the pattern which will tell which all programming block programmable block 
has to be configured on and off. So I can realize an adder in the FPGA. I can reprogram. I can erase the design. And then I can do the same FPGA to behave as if it is going to do a multiplication operation. It can also perform some kind of an encoding or a decoding operation. So essentially, it has some amount of reprogrammability that is there. But it is not like a general purpose CPU where it is a program which can fetch and decode. But it is much more flexible as far as your ASIC is concerned. FPGA holds a very significant kind of a role that it plays in architectural research. So, whenever you come up with any new research idea, the first thing that you do is rather than fabricating the IC, let us say any kind of variation in the processor design, in the cache memory design, it is not that easy because it is a very costly task to go and fabricate and check. So, you can check your designs in the FPGA. So, once it is portable in FPGA, if things are working in FPGA, that means you can very well go for the foundry and get it fabricated and then doing. So, FPGA will give you the first level proof of concept and proof of verification. So, when compared to ASIC, it gives little bit more kind of a flexibility that is there, but not as good as the flexibility offered by the general purpose computers. So, in the case of an FPGA, it is dynamically configured for different application. I can reprogram it, that is basically what it tells. It allows for an accelerator to be instantiated near the data it operates on. So, thereby it can reduce the communication cost. I can get the task done inside this, but it is lower in efficiency by roughly 10 to 100 percent as far as an ASIC is concerned, but it still it has its own pros and cons because as we move from ASIC, the flexibility increases. The next category is about GPUs. It accelerates multiple domains by incorporating specialized operation. We already had a discussion on GPUs, how GPUs work. And it offers order of magnitude better efficiency than CPU. And compared to CPU, GPU gives better efficiency. It gives near ASIC efficiency for applications that they really accelerate. But the only overhead is you need a multi-threaded program management that is there and heavy da data level parallelism is a requirement. So, GPUs make sense only if you are going to talk about applications where there is heavy data level parallelism and there should be effective control mechanism to handle these multiple threads that will take care of this parallel operations. We now introduce to little bit of how these architectures are really used in the latest trend of neural networks. Let us try to understand little fundamental concepts of neural network. So, what you see here in the diagram is a small neuron and you have some inputs x0, x1 and x2 and then there are this particular neuron is going to take this input. And what it does? There is a weight that is associated with each of this input. So, W0 means that how much significance I have to give to X0 in the final output. So, if W0 is more, then X0 will have a significant say in the final output. So, essentially we use a multiplication of the input and the corresponding weights. So, you have weights that is been given and then you have the inputs. And then there is an activation function. What it does? It performs a sigma operation wi into corresponding xi and then you apply a bias, you add it and that is basically your function and then you will get the corresponding output. So, in short, this is a neuron. So, in your neuron, you have an input that has been defined that is your data and how much of weight that you are going to give to the data, that is the weight that we are going to talk about and the activation function and bias will produce the corresponding output. Now, using these neurons, you can create neural networks. What you see here is a neuron and then you can see there are multiple layers of neurons. So, we call it as an input layer. Then there is an output layer which will produce the output and in between you have the hidden layer and you can see that the neurons are connected and the weights are typically there on the edges that connect one neuron to another. There can be designs which consist of multiple hidden layers. So, in this case, this is a design with the two hidden layer, hidden layer 1 and hidden layer 2. So, in short, your neural network is something like you have a set of connected neurons. Now, these neurons will perform some operation. It performs some multiplication and then adding operation. That is why it is called a bias. So, it is xi that is your input into the weight that is the wi. So, there involves some kind of a multiplication operation and then you have to accumulate and then add. There is a bias that is been added. So, all the neurons once you provide. So, you can consider neuron as an ALU which consists of two inputs that you give, the multiplication of that is been happening, 
After the multiplication, a small bias is added. So this multiply and add is the operation. The output is now as seen in the diagram. It is fed to the next layer. So in the typical neural network, we have multiple layers. Each layer consists of a set of neurons. In the initial layer, the neurons are fed with the input and there is a corresponding weight that is been given. Appropriate activation functions will perform the multiplication and the bias function will perform the adding. The result of the output of a neuron is given to the next layer and then appropriate weights are given. Like that, your neural network can have multiple layers that is possible. Ultimately, at the end, you will get an output. So, what is the connection between the neural network and the architecture codes that we learned? So, think of a case, this is a deep neural network where I have an image that is been given and then you need to write a computer program, a deep neural network program. Ultimately, it has to say that this is a Volvo car of this specific uh, series, XC90 series. So, in short, an image is given as an input and these are all neurons. You have multiple layers. These layers will do the activation function as well as the bias and ultimately, it will converge upon it. will tell whether it is a Volvo XC90 series or not. So, this image has been truncated into different units and these are going to be your inputs and some weights are been given. So, for this to happen, there is a process which is not a training process and then there is an inference process. We will come to know about it. So, this is a classical application. Given an image, are you able to say whether are you able to classify this image to whether it belongs to category A or category B. Now, there are different types of deep neural networks. One is known as a fully connected neural network where you have feed forwarding. So, all the layers are forwarding the values and we call it as a multi-layer perceptron. Sometimes we have convolutional neural networks. It is partially connected. It is feed forward. Sometimes it will perform a weight sharing also and then this is called the sparsely connected network that you have. So, the difference between a fully connected and a sparsely connected is here all the nodes are not connected. So, the, we do not be having edges in the old way. This is fully connected. You can see everything is connected to everything else. Whereas, other one you can see that this component is missing in this case. Whereas, this component is missing in this case. So, that is why it is called sparsely connected. We call them convolutional neural networks. And the last one is known as recurrent neural networks, where there exists a feedback. Some layers are giving its output to the previous layer to perform an operation. So, these are all different ways in which the neurons are being organized. You have a fully connected neural layer, we have a sparsely connected neural network and then we have a recurrent neural network where there is a feedback channel prior to the previous layers. Now, any kind of an application that you do with the help of a deep neural network, it has two phases. One is known as a training phase and the other one is known as an inference phase. So, what you do in a training phase? The whole purpose of the training phase is you have some set of data that is been available with you. In the same case, let us say you have a car, you have a series of images of car and then you feed into this and what you have to do is during this training process, you have to adjust the weights in such a way that the output is as per your requirement. So, what you have here in this diagram which will tell that you give the input features and you have the neural network that has been there with some weight initialization. And then given an input, I have given an input of a car and let us say as per the weight, it is telling it is not a car. But then we know that it is a car. So, accordingly the weight has to be adjusted. That is known as supervised training algorithm. The weight and the bias is adjusted such that whenever you give this as an input, it has to really represent it is as a car. And whenever we are giving something that is not a car as an input, then the output should be showing it as it is not a car at all. So, given with various input that you give, you have to adjust the weights multiple times and make sure that for all the inputs that you have given, clear convergence is that is been happening. So, we know the input and we know what classification of output it is and you have to make sure the correlation happens and that is called adjustment of weight and the bias. So, that is called the first phase of any deep neural network application. The second phase is known as inference. What you do here? you apply the weight. So, now the weights are all finalized and then you apply the deep neural network and then you have to get it. So, for example, let us say I am going to give this as an image and then your deep neural network that is a machine learning inference will perform this activation function, the input and the weight, the multiplication of that plus the bias that is being added. 
it will tell whether it is a cat or not. So, he, here in this case, it will tell with a 80 percent confidence or so 0.8 probability that it is a cat, 1 percent or 0.1 probability that it is a dog, like that multiple confidence level also it is been given. So, given an input, finalizing the weight is known as training. After finalizing the weights and the bias, given an input, classification of an input is known as the inference that we use. Now, we use powerful computers in order to get this training done because the training is done on a huge data. So, you may have to train millions of images such that your weights are being converged. Now, if the weights are being converged, then the training is really fast if and only if we have something like a tiled chip multicore processor that you have, wherein continuously you give images and then you adjust the weight. So, we need quick training. Quick training can be possible only if you have a very fast architecture where you can exploit the parallelism that is available inside the application. In this case, the application consists of matrix multiplication or and the addition of the bias that we have already talked about in the neural network case. Now, when you talk about any deep neural network, it consists of an input and then multiple layers are there. Now, some of these layers are convolution layers and some of them are fully connected layers. So, we have one or two fully connected layers and ranging from 5 to 1000 layers of convolution layers are there. So, what is your convolution? Your convolution layer consists of a convolution operation that is the sigma function that sigma of x i into the w i that is the product of the weight and the input followed by an activation function that you have and then the bias that is being applied. So, this is essentially what you do in the case of a convolution operation and the activation function will take care of this activation and the bias. In the case of a fully connected network also the concept is still the same still we have to perform because only thing is the weights are there for all and the input is there for all. So, in both the cases there exists a convolution which is the major operation. So, let us try to understand what is a convolution. We have an input feature map and then we have a convolution layer which is also known as a filter or it is also known as a kernel. So, this acts as a small matrix, this is an input matrix and then you perform the corresponding matrix operation to get the output feature map. So, in short you have the weight and then you have the input that is there and appropriate multiplication is there in order to produce the output feature map. Now, once you get the output feature map based upon that you go to the subsequent layer. So, convolutions account for more than 90 percent of overall computation, it dominate runtime and energy consumption. Now, let us try to see what happens in this convolution. So, consider these input features that we have the green one, the blue one and the red one and then we told this is the vector. Now, what we see is we can see that the product is being applied whatever is the vector value on top of the vector value whatever is the existing value here is multiplied with the vector value. So, this is the operation that is been done and at the end of that we apply a bias such that we get a unique value that is been there. But moving forward if you see that when you perform the appropriate convolution operation you get one element of the output. Similarly, if you move it across. So, this has to be moved it across and each time you are going to get one more kind of an input data. So, as we move across the one full row, we get the first full row of it and then you move to the next row and then the appropriate values are being obtained in this case. Similarly, once the kernel is moved across the input, then we are able to produce one output range that you have. So, in short, it involves lot of multiplication or this convolution operation with frequently changing data that is your weight and the input. And then after performing this operation, you get the output range that is there, the output vector that you have. This output vector act as the input to the next layer. So, it involves lot of computation, lot of parallel computation that you can do and the result of computation need to propagate to the next processing element which is going to carry. Here lies the scope of the tiled chip multicore processors, wherein these computations can be done in the processors and then the resultant data can be easily moved through the interconnect to the next processing element in order to carry out the rest of the operations. So, we have already seen how a deep neural network computation that happens. So, you have to carry 
your filters or the weights that you have, the input features, it will come into a global buffer and then these convolutions are done in processing elements that you can see a tiled chip multicore architecture which you have seen. We have an NOC that connects these P's. So, in short what happens the steps involved in processing one particular layer is from the off chip memory that is your DRAM, you move the data into the global buffer, it travel through the NOC into the appropriate processing element where input feature map and layer parameters are being moved into the PE and in the PE you perform the actual operation, the convolution operation is been done and the activation function is done and once the output feature map is obtained, it will travel through the NOC again back to the global buffer and then you are going back into the off chip memory. This is one layer. Similarly, you do it for the other layer. So, with this diagram, you get a picture about the conventional tiled chip multicore architectures that we have learned where you have multiple processing elements that are being connected by an NOC. So, the input feature value and the weight matrix value which is of huge because when you have lot of layers, these values are already stored, your input can be an image, the weight is a matrix, this is already stored in your memory. From the memory, it has to be fetched. So, through the memory controllers, these values will enter and there is a global buffer where it reaches and from the global buffer through the interconnect it reaches appropriate. So, each processing element will perform the convolution of a small component. So, it is something like what you have seen in the GPU, you divide the entire input space into multiple smaller chunks, each of this chunk value, its convolution is actually happening in one of the processing element. So, the input feature as well as the corresponding weight or the kernel has to reach into the processing element and once the processing is been done. The result has to travel through the NOC into the global buffer and back to your off chip memory. Now, let us see what is the typical convolution operation that you have. What you see in the diagram is a 4 by 4 mesh NOC tiled chip multicore processor and then you have a main memory where the input feature map is stored, the filters are stored. Now, you are going to perform a layer of the neural network computation. So, in short the contents that is the input feature map and the filter has to reach into the TCMP. So, that has been shown here, this feature map will reach this memory interface that you have and then from the memory interface what will you typically do? We have to identify which are the processing elements. So, since you have let us say 6 class of filters that you have, I can call it as 1, 2, 3, then 4, 5, 6. So, this much of uh, filters that you are going to do. So, your data has to move into these processing elements as packets through the network on chip and that is what is been shown here. From the memory interface, this data will reach the corresponding processing elements and once it reaches the processing elements, now you have your input features and the filters that is also available. So, now the filter has to move, so the filter also will come there and then one will go here, the two will come here. 3, then this is 4, this is 5, this is 6. So, the input feature has already reached the corresponding processing element. Appropriate filter also has to go into the processing elements. Now, you perform the convolution. So, once the convolution is been done, then the result is available in the processing elements. So, this is been done parallelly. Here lies the power of a TCMP, you do it parallelly and then what happens is the result that is been obtained in each of these processing elements has to propagate back into the single point, the collection point that is your memory interface. So, these are all traveling through the network as NOC packets and its proper segmentation and reassembly has to be done. So, you got the output value that is available in the MI and then from the MI the output feature map is being transferred through the memory controller and it reaches the main memory. So, this is now layer I. Now, this act as an input to the layer I plus 1. So, again this has been going and sometimes rather than switching into the main memory, I can get this task done also by merely moving from 1. So, let us say I know that from here it has to go here. So, then the output feature can directly go there, appropriate weight matrix can come. Sometimes it can be input stationary, the input values remain same and it can be sometimes weight stationary. So, there are different kind of architectures that are going to talk about it. So, in short we have to understand that TCMP plays a major role in applications where there are lot of convolution, the underlying architecture will really help us. 
with a lot of machine learning applications where deep neural networks are there, effective communication and faster convolution can be really done with the help of the inherent tiled architecture and seamless communication and parallelism that TCMP offers for this. So, future many kind of deep neural network application where TCMP is going to be a must hardware that people are looking forward for. So, we know that this is the conventional architecture that we have seen and there should be a mapping that is there the activity of which node which processing element will do and then you have to transfer the weights that is being told the weights are stored in memory and then appropriately it will reach the processing elements and it has to be transferred through the NOC in order to reach the processing element. So, this is what we have seen. Now, for any kind of architecture that we are going to talk we need to understand what are the performance parameters. In this one of the parameter is throughput which talks about the number of execution of task that can be completed in a given period of time. How many inferences I can make? What is an inference? Given an image, you have to tell what it is, whether it is a cat, whether it is a dog, whether it is a car or not. So, it records a lot of, because passing through this neural network, the computations has to be done, the result of that has to be propagated into that processing element, where the neuron of that layer is been fixed. So, how many inferences I can do? That is called throughput. TCMP architecture will give a lot of good throughput in that. The second one is latency. Given an input, how much time it will take to infer that, to tell that that is a cat, to tell that that is a dog. So, that is called the time between the beginning of a task and its completion is known as the inference latency. So, these are two parameters and there are many other parameters. I am drawing your attention into the architecture perspective with a lot of applications working with deep neural network. We need to offer the best possible hardware such that the application will get benefit out of the computational capability of a TCMP as well as the faster communication and parallelism that an NOC based system can offer. Now, if you look into the inferences per second, it depends upon operations per second into 1 by operations per inference that is called your inferences per second. Operations per second depends upon the DNN hardware and the DNN model, what kind of a DNN model that you have operations per inference dependent upon the DNN model. So, this is typically the DNN structure and this is typically the underlying hardware that we use. Now, to get good performance from an architect's perspective, operations per second is defined as 1 by cycles per operation into cycles per second. This is what the peak throughput of the processing element that you have and then more larger TCMP. So, it will improve parallelism, the number of processing elements is there. Now, are you really able to map your neural network into this processing element? That is a utilization of processing element. So, if you are not able to give enough work to this processing element, then they are not utilized. So, degradation due to inability to utilize the processing elements. So, all display. So, one is the size of the PE, the size of the mapping algorithm which will tell which PE has to do what task. All are going to impact the number of operations that you can perform on a second. So, how do you do that? Cycles per operation? Cycles per operation, I can decrease the cycles to perform an operation by a non pipeline multi cycle MAC versus a pipeline MAC. So, when you have a pipeline MAC architecture, I can reduce this component, how fast you can do. So, optimization in the arithmetic circuit of a MAC will speed up certain things. Now, cycles per second, this depends upon increase the clock frequency, it is a micro architectural improvement that you do. So, one is with respect to a pipeline design, architectural level optimization of the unit which perform the convolution, how fast you can do the clocking speed at which and then here it is about the scalability larger TCMP, if the area is fixed you reduce the PE area, it is a trade off between storage and the impact of PE utilization and then you use an excellent mapping algorithm which will tell that what kind of a data flow technique that you have. So, in short we learned about in what way your TCMP architecture is going to be crucial as far as the performance of a neural network application is being concerned. And then if you wanted to know more about this topic of domain specific accelerators, it is an upcoming emerging area. We have done a work with the Professor Mauricio Palaisi from University of Catania. It is an approximate computing technique on resource constrained edge devices. You will get more information about this. Uh, 
much more deeper course in this URL. There are pre-recorded videos and slides that are been available. So, those who are interested in exploring further in the domain specific accelerators, kindly explore this. This will give you a much more deeper idea about what is the role that an underlying hardware is been playing. In an era where neural network applications, AI and ML applications are getting lot of traction, we have to understand for an AI application to really sustain, we need to have an underlying hardware also that is equally supportive. So, any AI ML application happens on a computing device. So, inherently in the base of all these is a computing device, a processing engine. And to get that good performance, you require parallel processing engines. And typically TCMPs, multi-core processors are classical examples of such parallel processing engines. So, it is not only about a deep neural network or a conventional neural network that gives the performance. It is the joint handshaking between a good application and an underlying architecture that support this will give you performance for the future giant applications. So, we are coming to the end of this particular lecture where we started with what is the concept of an ASIC versus an FPGA versus a GPUs versus a CPU. We have seen the flexibility component, the cost component, the reprogrammability component. Then we introduce the concept of neurons, neural networks, the layers, the convolution operation and how this convolution operation is been mapped into processing elements and how interaction between the processing elements is been done and how can you improve the performance parameters. So, with this we conclude this lecture. Thank you. Thank you.